This guy's like the mayor around here. Well, I'll tell you, it's going to be a big night. Boss is here. Everyone's here. Back to you guys in the booth. Hello everyone and welcome to MMA Start to Finish. I'm Julian and this is Matt. Hello. This is the show where we attempt to go through every UFC, Pride, WEC, and Strike Force event, even the ones that make me want to eat a gun. <laughs> this one wasn't that No, bad. I'm, I'm being a baby. This, this event was okay. Yeah. There was some uh, exciting stuff on here, nothing wild, but before we get into that, let's talk about what we're talking about today. UFC 23, which was the UFC's second only event in Japan. Much smaller arena this time. Didn't quite have the the pull smaller, to get the big Yokohama Dome. Less grandiose. And we're bringing back the tournament this time. Yeah, they are having a... It, it's Calling it a tournament is a little grandiose. It's like a, a two-fight tournament. So the first fight of the tournament is the semifinal, and then you're in the final. This... Fun fact, would be the last ever UFC event to feature a one-night tournament. Last one. I would have thought they would bring it back at some point for like a 10-year anniversary or something. It's like not safe. It's I know. It's a bad idea. But like, for... they ha- I was reading the Wikipedia page for this and they noted that uh, they have multi-night tournaments in the future. Okay. But they, they don't go back to the... Uh, are they like? Let's con- see who's not in the hospital at the end of the night. Formula. Are they consecutive nights in a row, or is it I like? I don't know. Probably not. We'll get to it down right. the line. To give you an idea of how much smaller the arena is for like an American perspective, if you're familiar with Madison Square Garden, and then next to MSG, there's like the MSG Theater, which is just like a theater-sized venue, um, but it's still MSG. Like, oh, look at that! It's still in New York City. This is that, but for Tokyo. And I don't know if it was the Yokohama Arena or the Tokyo Dome. Let's, actually, let me look. Yes, so it is in Tokyo. I think the original arena, like the main arena, is the... Hold on. So, Mike Goldberg made it sound like this was like a sister arena to a very large arena in Tokyo. But looking at the very small Wikipedia article for this venue... um. It says it's an indoor sporting arena located in the Tokyo Disney Resort. It's a 7,000 person capacity. Oh, that's tiny. Yeah, it hosts local sporting events and concerts that require a smaller facility than (laughs) RK Coliseum. (laughs) Aww. That's like a school event kind of thing. Oh, another fun fact before we get into the fights, and I'm sure you're all getting very antsy to watch clips of Kevin Randleman celebrate, but... This event was the first, I believe the article said, event to not have a home video release because SEG was just bleeding money yeah. and did not have the money to do a VHS release. So. They were nearing bankruptcy, Yeah, which really makes me question some of the statements of, was it Mike Goldberg who keeps calling? It's usually him? Mike Goldberg who's saying some wild shit, so you're safe in that assumption most of the time. The, the, like, this is the Olympics of something? Like, this is the pinnacle of combat sports, that kind yeah. of shit. So, like, unfortunately, at this time, no, it is not. Especially in Japan. So, we'll, we'll talk more about it later, but UFC Japan was supposed to be its own thing, and it never really got off the ground because pride is a thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's get into that first fight. Oh, wait, one more thing. You might be asking yourself, hey, if you're following along, why is there a heavyweight championship fight? Didn't we just watch Boss Rutten win the title and Kevin Randleman be all mad? Well, new champion will be crowned. And he will be crowned because of some recent news in the UFC. Boss Rutten has officially relinquished his heavyweight belt. He will fight in the future in the middleweight division. And as of our broadcast day today, the middleweight division no longer has a champion named Frank Shamrock, as Shamrock has recently announced his retirement. Jeff and- Boss retired. Retired the strong word because he is well, just moving down a weight yeah, class. I, he, he left the belt. He relinquished the title. Yeah. No, I think I know why you said retired, though. I think the Wikipedia article says he retired, which is just wrong. <laughs> so, you know, this is why teachers tell you not to use Wikipedia in school. 
You might using, say Boss Rutan retired when he really just relinquished his title. We're using a primary source, the fight itself. This is true. And the recordings. Also, we have not Joe Rogan back for interviews All post fight. We got Die Joe Rogan. Mr. Look, James Wormy. Look at this man in his red polo with his aggressively 90s haircut. He's yeah. a little he he's a little stretched out just so that we fit the full frame. Yeah, but every it, sh- it should be kind of obvious at this point if you if you watch the show. But all of our screenshots, in order to not give you black bars on the side, are just like incredibly stretched. Let That's us, part of the game. Let us know if you don't mind black bars. Yeah, at le- if you really have a strong preference, leave a comment. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, this is this is Diet Rogan. And um, he works he, well enough. He actually did a pretty decent job. I mean, he was a little goofy here and there, but you know. So it was early Joe. Yeah, and it's not like a you know a high value production here, no, high budget production. This could be a one and done thing. Yeah, he, for him. He, he's probably like just intending to use this for like his sizzle reel when he applies for other things. He's not even yeah. probably intending on making this a long term gig. Kevin finally pulled it out. He may have been screwed over in his bout against Boss Rutan, but this time fighting basically the same fight um, gets the W. The judges in Japan apparently have vision, so they were able to sort this one out properly. Justice for Kevin. And Kevin was the smaller man for once uh, by 32 pounds and 5 inches. He was smaller but as always, the densest fighter in the octagon. Oh, yeah. He is a triangle. By exponential magnitudes. The first round wasn't bad. No, the fight... So the fight wasn't necessarily bad. It's just, you know, what you would expect from a Kevin Randleman fight. A lot of takedowns, a lot of ground and pound from guard that really never threatens to finish the fight, but definitely wins you rounds. The first round was actually really competitive, and you could probably even argue Pete won. Toward the end, he landed these like decent strikes that caught Kevin off balance, and he wound up, as you can see, in mount here and was able to get some pretty decent o- offense off before the round ended. It was a weird mount before that, though. Uh, Pete yeah. was just kind of sitting on Kevin's face. He, he, he was in mount, but he was like facing the wrong way. Yeah. So he had to rotate over... And it was yeah, it was very strange. At the end of the first round, after Pete had mounted him, he laid on the floor for a while. Yeah, like he looked like he was having some issues, and commentary even pointed it out. Big John came and talked to him. I mean, he he would go on to win the fight and probably win every other round in the fight. But things were. I wonder if you had a less experienced official and they saw a fighter. Staying on the ground like that at the end of the round and not really getting up, if they would have made, because you can make the decision as the ref to be like, actually, you seem like you're not good to go. We're gonna call it now. You can do that. I think I remember commentary saying something about how with that weird position that Pete had on him, uh, it was Randleman's left arm that was like pinned in a weird way. So his arm was probably fucked up and he was just laying there dealing with that. Yeah, like having a knee on the bicep or something. Yeah, that's that makes sense. So that I I could see Big John or any ref really giving you more time for that than if you were like cloudy. Yeah. So he was just like, oh god, my arm. Let me give me a moment. In round two, uh, it got more into just guard play, and Pete tried to get an arm bar. At it looked good for a minute. Uh, that was the most exciting part, and Kevin muscled out of it because he is a muscle. Yeah, the monster, as I believe the nickname they were oh, using yeah. for. Him That's today. right. Uh, round three, more of the same, and Pete's starting to look kind of tired. Yeah, rounds really two. Round two, Pete was still putting up some offense with that armbar attempt, and he still looked pretty active off of his back. But a lot of round two, and virtually the entirety of rounds three through five, looked like this. Okay, it was just Kevin in Pete's guard doing enough to win the round. Yep. You know, it, it was not the worst fight I've ever seen. 
I've seen much less active, much worse fights. It wasn't a Ken Hoist situation where they just laid there. No, it wasn't the the Michigan standoff, as I'm going to refer to that as. Okay. Or no, that's that's Dan Severn and Ken, yeah. which is the one where they weren't allowed to throw punches. You remember that one? <laughs> yeah, that fucking club. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna get sidetracked. Point being, fight was all right. It was okay. Yeah. I think towards the end of that last round, uh, they either maybe their corners yelled it to him, I didn't hear it, but they started to get the idea that, all right, this is the end. We should probably try and do something to show that, look, ooh, I'm the winner here. Yeah. Or, like, try to finish Make it. Make a show of it for the judges. Uh, Kevin tried to get a takedown. It went nowhere. So they were just kind of walking around each other for a bit, maybe throwing a jab just to get the distance and then in the with 30 seconds remaining big john was, like brought them together and was like please fight please do things and then separated them to get them to go again yeah not to be disrespectful but my notes for round five are just z z z z z z z not a lot going on here toward the end and to give you an idea of what you're in for if you're just listening to us and you're not watching the fight yourselves there was a decent bit of this lay and pray offense here tonight that does kind of make you sleepy. So by the time we'd gotten to the main event, and that was like pretty much the entirety of the last three rounds, um, I was I was like halfway to Dreamland already. So to, to be fair to them, it wasn't just them tonight that uh, implemented this offense. Yeah, but we got a new heavyweight champ. New champion. Kevin is vindicated. The belt strapped around his waist. I do think it's a little weird that they did this in Japan if they intended on making UFC Japan its own thing. Because you'd think you'd want to put the emphasis on the, you know, the UFC J champion, which is like the winner of the tournament. I won't talk more about that later. But yeah, you'd think you'd want to establish more of like prestige and brand presence that way you'd also think you'd want to save your heavyweight title fight for something stateside no yeah uh, instead of having it somewhere where they're not even going to do a home release yeah a home video release yeah that really you know says a lot about the prestige of your fucking organization right now makes me wonder when they had this fight because it wasn't was it pay-per-view yeah they did so according to wikipedia there was a limited pay-per-view uh feed in Japan, Brazil, and the United States. So I'm wondering what time they did this at. Oh, I we talked about this, I think, last show when we were thinking about um, UFC Japan. But they just um, ran it at the live hour. And if you were a hardcore and you, the only person watching UFC 23 on pay-per-view live would have been a fucking hardcore, yeah. you would just stay up until like 1 or 2 when it started or whatever time it started and just watch it at like odd hours of the night I mentioned last time that I've done that for pro wrestling stuff in Japan uh, like years ago so yeah that's just what you do I would say surely they had a like a replay maybe the next day Uh, yeah there's always so have you ever bought a pay-per-view before no so whenever you buy a pay-per-view there's always replays of the pay-per-view that like just run on that channel for like the next like two days so you basically like have it on demand to watch before like on demand was like a feature okay so like you you can't really restart it in 1999 and watch it from the beginning but like if you missed part of it or you um didn't want to watch it live because you respect your sleep schedule Mm -hmm. you could watch the replay later that's always a thing but my counterpoint to that is I wonder if they could afford that. to run the replay. Yeah. I could be wrong about this because I I don't like, you know, fucking buy pay-per-view sl- spots, but I would I think just based on the like my knowledge of like how pay-per-view channel guide looks like it works that when you buy a like a pay-per-view showing, you're buying like, that's the price for not just the airing, but the replays, too. Okay. Like, you're just buying a slot. Like, I don't... Maybe, especially back then, you could, because pay-per-view is more ubiquitous, and people were probably doing it as one-offs with no replays more often. But in my experience, mostly with pro wrestling, like, 
I've I've never seen a pay per view that like appears once and is like gone. I wonder if they have cheaper options ever. If you were of age in 1999 and happened to watch this and like purchase it live, that'd be really cool. Tell us about it in the comments. We'd love to hear about your adventures um, being irresponsible at three o'clock in the morning to watch fights that you'd be ashamed to tell your family about. Definitely did it. I wow. It is over. It is over. McCarthy stopped it. I don't know if I saw a towel come in there, if the corner yelled stop it, but... The co-main event and the main event also kind of function like a tournament. That, that actually confused me a little bit at the beginning of the show when they were talking about it. I thought it might have been a one-night tournament tonight, and I was kind of like, what? Losing it a little bit. But no, the co-main event, Siyoshi Kosaka, Pedro Hizo, is a number one contendership fight for the winner of the main event. So Pedro, as you saw, punching poor TK in the face while he was on his knees, uh, has reigned victorious here and will be taking on, presumably, Kevin in the future for that for that belt. Yeah. And that'll be an interesting fight. That that'll be an interesting fight because as we saw here, uh Pedro's favorite thing on planet Earth is leg kicks. Big, meaty, mean leg kicks. Echoing just... throughout the I guess theater. Yeah, the theater. Mm -hmm. You'd say stadium normally, but it's not quite accurate here. Mm -hmm. Um just you know, the, the kind that bruise your bones, the fun kind. So those kicks, throwing those kicks does kind of make you susceptible to takedowns because you don't have, like, your full balance. So it's going to be interesting to see if he's able to stop Kevin from holding him down and giving him noogies for 25 minutes. Kevin might be able to eat them. I'm less concerned about Kevin's defense and actually more concerned about Pedro's offense because I think it's ideal for Kevin to neutralize. With that said... Mark kind of struggled with the leg kicks as a wrestler, but I'd hope at this point Kevin has developed some kind of strategy to deal with them, especially considering like the very obvious like fact that when you're doing leg kicks, your feet, or when you're doing any kick, both your feet are on the fucking ground, so it's easier to take Break you down. Balance. Yeah. yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. It probably sounds like we're being mad disrespectful to Siyoshi Kosaka, just not talking about him and his fight at all. But to be honest with you, he really didn't do a lot. He ate a lot. He, he ate a lot. A lot of leg kicks. Yeah. A lot of leg kicks, and then eventually a singular bop to the dome from a knee. Mm -hmm. It looks like he's, uh, it's funny, in this frame it looks like he's helping him up. But uh, no, he's loading up to punch him in the face, so... No friendship here, folks. I like Pedro's shirt when he walked out. Oh, that's right. Do you want to, for those that didn't see it, do you want to tell us what his shirt said? Fear me for who I know. Fear me for who I am. And fear me for what I have done. All right, Pedro. Do you, do you have, you know, some crime to confess to or some, you know, like cult affiliation you want to reveal to us? I'm a little more afraid of what he will do. <laughs> yeah, what he's going to do in the octagon. Yeah. Yamasaki steps in and Fuji, just as I said, was unable to do damage on his feet. So typically what we do here is we go in reverse chronological order, but due to the weird tournament inserted into the card tonight, that's going to make things a little weird. So typically we'd be talking about the main event of the tournament right now, because that would be in reverse chronological order. But we're going to go back and we're going to talk about the two semifinals first. So, so we don't automatically spoil them yeah it's just it's just weird so allow us to transport you in time to the beginning of the night the very first fight of the night which was could could i'm gonna fuck this man's name up and i apologize katsui fuji and Ma masutatsu yano i've done my best i apologize katsuhisa fuji versus Ma masutatsu yano the last names are very easy. I'm just going to call them Fuji and Yano. Fuji. That's not difficult, Fuji. even a little bit. Yano. So this, like I mentioned, was part of the two-fight tournament tonight to crown the first ever UFC Japan champion, which is interesting, but also knowing how this project pans out years down the line is kind of funny because... Uh, 
the fact that the winner of this tournament gets a belt feels very silly. <laughs> like, don't rob it from them when I'm they not don't trying even to, know. I'm not trying to rob them. It's just like knowing they aspired for this to be like its own, like not independent, but like fully functional organization and not just like a one-off event. So they're like, oh, this is the champ for our new wing of fighting. And uh, th- no, we come back here one more time, bro. That's it. A weird, a weird finish to this one. Some may say it was a little bit early. It was kind of early. They could have kept going. I don't hold it too much against the ref. I think it was like very borderline. I think you could pretty much justify approaching that either way. I mean, Yano wasn't down. He certainly, like, you could not make an argument that he was out. But, like, was he intelligently defending himself? I guess that's up for debate. Honestly, the fight itself was kind of uneventful outside of some big shots in the very beginning. So the the magnitude of the strikes that landed I, to the ref might look like more than a, in a more active fight, if that makes sense, especially in the first fight of the night. In the moment, get it to the ref kind of psychology. Looked, in the moment, it kind of looked like he was crumpling against the fence a little bit in reality he may have just been trying to back away really quick and maybe i don't know about stumbling but just not thinking too much about anything else other than just trying to back up really quick and just trying to defend himself block himself yeah oh and another thing to note here is really like no good place to mention this but one of the fighters i believe it was it was yano right his finger, you pointed this out, pinky, came out of the glove. Yeah, uh, not quality equipment, I gloves, guess. Gloves are shit. <laughs> um, the gloves are shit now, too, but uh, they don't want to pay for better technology. Mm-hmm. And that is, a, that is a long, interesting story for another day. But the gloves are bad, and the gloves have always been bad. It, the weird thing that you pointed out was, I suggested, oh, maybe the material's bad, and they just ripped, and that's how his pinky came out. But you can kind of see here. There's no real tear. There's no hole. It's just like not in the glove. So w- what the fuck is going on here? I don't know. Like maybe there's like holes in the palm area. You have like secondary options for your fingers. That seems like a great way for somebody to get poked in the eye with the material. No, like so I think on some MMA gloves I've seen they actually have like cutouts for the palm so you can better feel where your hand is oh and he was just like chilling with his pinky out like between rounds maybe maybe not on purpose but like maybe putting it on he just never realized he was just like yep good I'm ready puts it on right before he walks out Katsu's bigger physically dimensionally a little bit I mean weight wise he's only oh that's something actually notable about the tournament it's open weight which is weird yeah there's no weight classes for the tournament um i guess they were trying to i don't want to say bite because it's not like pride invented the concept of open weight but they contemporarily contemporarily in 1999 did open weight fighting in pride in japan whereas in the ufc in america it was you know they're starting to develop weight classes so they probably figured oh if we're going to start a branch over here it probably makes sense for us to make it open weight because that's what they do here Mm -hmm. and also just realistically that opens up more options for who you're going to have fight when you make it open weight especially in like a fledgling i I hesitate to use the word promotion because again they only did one more event but you get the gist they were trying they did their best you know for a company that was going bankrupt to bring us you know some some fun fights i can respect it open weight good in concept at least for like anyone fighting anyone who's the best of the best kind of thing bad in practice it's bad in practice once you have people who are like at a high level of skill because when we started the sport in 93 with the UFC and like nobody knew what the fuck they were doing, the size like really didn't matter and there was like skill gaps and you could see interesting things happen. But once everybody has like a fleshed out, well rounded skill set, then size does matter. Mm-hmm. Like 
then then you have stuff where you could probably take Demetrius Johnson, who was like the pound for pound, probably one of the greatest fighters ever. He'd probably get destroyed by your average welterweight just because dude has like 50 pounds on him. It's just like, and he's also a trained martial artist and has a huge advantage. So like once you get the higher level of skill you have, the more like physical advantages start to matter. Mm -hmm. That's true for like any sport, I guess, but especially in something like this. We started the sport with people like... One boxing glove. One boxing glove, sumo wrestlers, an old... Was it the guy in his 50s who was the one boxing glove? No, that was a different uh, gentleman. Okay, but so still... We had an old karate dude, an old black karate dude, yeah. uh, Ron Van Cleef. I, I was right about his name Okay. Um, from, from last time we talked about that. and Like a bar brawler, and then uh, the one student who's martial art a student of a martial art that is now like quintessential what are you talking hoist? about oh yeah you're talking about hoist yeah 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 no it's like who's gonna win mm, probably him yeah no, now 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 we know you yeah know, watching back but back then everybody must have been like who's this skinny nerd who's this legendary man from brazil early stoppage or not Fuji moves on to the finals of this tournament. He did land this pretty decent strike here in order to advance things to that kind of confusing point. So it's not like it was like a freak thing that won him the fight. But regardless, Mario Yamasaki pulls him off and Fuji advances to the UFC Japan tournament final. Him and his pointy cup. Coming out of the red corner, if you want to talk about the more charismatic fighter of the two, it is certainly this man, Kenichi Yamamoto, 23 years old, born in Osaka, belongs to the Power of Dream gym. You can see him draped with the red robe and almost a Tyson-like look. Ladies and gentlemen, the sauce on this man, the absolute pizzazz, the only man to walk out to unique music in, I cannot remember how long. Granted does eventually transform into the regular UFC song. And granted, his sauce is just a North Face jacket. Mm -hmm. But I respect the effort. Do you think that's his personal jacket or they bought it for this? I think they bought it for the event. It looks brand new. It looks like fresh right out of, <laughs> right out of Sears. I think my man with his blonde hair has a decent enough amount of money that he just keeps nice clothes. He, uh, he seems like he's a keen fashion sense. Mm-hmm. And if you thought this was the only interesting character in tonight's fight, you were wrong. We have Kenichi Yamamoto taking on Daiju Takasi. Takasi, we've seen before in the UFC. He fought Jeremy Horn in a fight where he was very outsized. And, well, would you look at that again? He's very outsized again, at least in the weight department. By 34 pounds. Yeah, that's a... That's a big yikes from me, dog. Could you imagine if... So, in the other fight, who was who was the bigger man? Uh, Ka, Fuji. He was, I think, 210, 213 something pounds versus 170. It, it's like Takasi has a thing for fighting dudes that could have him for lunch because he fought... In pride, I'm, the man's name is escaping me, but he fought that sumo wrestler and like played chicken between his legs. You know what? You're right. So, this this dude loves playing David. I don't know what to tell you. The world is full of Goliaths to him, and he loves taking his nap. He came pre knocked out. He loves taking his pre fight nap. It's a very important part of his routine. Without the pre fight nap, he forgets how to pull guard for the entire fight. Yeah. Uh, this isn't like after the fight. This is before the fight. He's, he's oh, just laying down. He he be, he do be chilling. Yeah, which I mean, same. Was it interesting first round? It looked like we were in for a, a fun fight, especially when Yamamoto opened up with some strikes, and then Takasi pulled guard, and Yamamoto decided that he wanted to do headbutts uh, to the body of his grounded opponent. Which was an interesting decision. Takasi just kind of wiggled a lot. It it wasn't super effective. So round one was was okay. There were some elbows in there from to Yamamoto's head. Some decent ground and pound was applied. Yeah, but the most interesting thing 
and the thing I want to spend the most time talking about that came out of round one was inhaler gate. You know, a couple of punches he threw in the first flurry and uh, what... What the fuck did I just see? Like, the cameraman was all over that shit, too. And the corner didn't... The corner didn't care. Did his corner man have, like, a bottle of string cheese he was feeding him in between rounds? Like, what the fuck is going on here? It it looks... You would have to imagine it's some sort of, like, proto-inhaler. And based on the fact that I saw nothing... Inhalers have been around longer. It didn't look like an inhaler, though. It wasn't like the traditional, like, whole, you know, the shape of it. It looked like a spray can. It didn't look like an inhaler. It looked like an aerosol can. It might be like a sports thing. That's why I said a proto-inhaler. Okay. Um, Based on the fact that the broadcast didn't say anything about it, and I couldn't find any note of it in the Wikipedia entry, I'm just going to have to assume he had that cleared by I don't know who I don't know what athletic commission would be sanctioning this I guess just like the UFC cleared it I don't know I don't know how you go about getting your inhaler approved to get a bit modern with it Can we uh, talk about Greg Hardy now Greg Hardy yeah, all right go ahead, talk about Greg Hardy and, uh he also used an inhaler between rounds but it was an actual inhaler you saw to approve uh no it was not no, you saw to approve no. narrator would it ever be approved to have an inhaler? No. Yeah. I, I mean, now, no. Back then, I don't know what... L listen, Japan is the... Still is, but especially back then, the wild, wild west for fights. They put in pride in their contracts explicitly, we will not test you for steroids. They, they put a, a big list of stuff that they're going to test you for, and then under that it says, we will not test you for steroids. <laughs> so as far as what their medical medical protocols are over there when it comes to medications, I wouldn't be shocked to find out if they were like, actually, this is completely fine. And I guess, like, did, check Wikipedia. Did they have any... They like, made no note of this. N no, any extra fighters... If there was, like, a DQ? I read through the article, and I didn't recall seeing anything about an alternate or a backup, no. So, maybe that just wasn't allowed, and... They were like, they, shit, we don't have anybody else, so we're not gonna say anything about it? We just gotta let them do it. Dude, it was weird. Anyway, the fight would continue, and really, the whole fight was just Takasi pulling guard and Yamamoto growing increasingly frustrated and attempting to get some offense off and eventually winning a decision. A unanimous decision for Kenichi Yamamoto. And he will fight in our tournament final against Fuji. Yamamoto did, uh, I guess it doesn't really count if he only does it once. He got out just to be like, come on, fight me. But then he went right back in and didn't really back into. I mean, into I don't. I can't guard. really put. I feel like we've had this conversation before, but I can't really put too much blame on the guy who's trying to strike. For me, it's the dude who's like pulling guard and constantly falling on his ass who's responsible to like engage, because it's just brain dead as a striker to like a dude who falls down and is a grappler to jump into his guard. Like, you just, like, wouldn't do that. And in a real fight, if a dude's laying on his back, you're just going to kick him in the fucking head. So it, it, it feels kind of cheap to expect the striker. Like, if you're able to, tr as the grappler, trick the striker into, like, pursuing you into your guard, that's fine. But, like, to expect the striker to be like, oh, boy, I'm coming in for the hug. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Do you think this is where we should make an exception to allow the soccer kicks? Dude, I can't wait until <laughs> Pride where people get sent like fucking Lionel Messi scoring a goal, dude. I can't yeah. wait for it. Stuff you can't show grandma. So the 23-year-old wins the UFCJ tournament by submission. And he waited for his opportunity and literally... And now we return you in the night to where we would have been if we didn't have to deal with this weird tournament nonsense. Prior to Pedro Hizo and TK, we had Yamamoto take on Fuji in the tournament final. And 
what a victory for Yamamoto, dude. The the brash man with the fun entrance music was able to pull it off. Maybe it had something to do with the things he kept inhaling betwixt rounds. Yeah, I'm just going to pretend he wasn't uh, supplementing his performance because it makes me feel better about things. I mean, he was clearly supplementing himself. Yes. Regardless of that. That is uh, doubtless. Uh, But the extra supplements. It was a close fight. Fuji got off some pretty decent ground and pound at certain points. Especially at the end of the first round, he was able to get a lot off there. But... As the fight progressed, they got into like an entanglement and Yamamoto was able to yank up one of those legs and secure a lock and uh, win that belt. And looking at the weights again, I just realized that would have been an almost 50 pound difference. Yeah, no, uh, Takasi, no offense, has no place in this open weight format. Dude's trying to get murdered. He's a death wish. He's biting off more than he can chew. (laughs) By, like, a factor of 10, yes. Well, by a factor of 10 was that sumo fight. That's what I'm and referring to. He, didn't he... He won that, didn't he? I think so. I think he just ma- made that dude run in circles like a Wile E. Coyote cartoon until he got tired and then was able to, like, win. The, At- the sumo... I can't remember his name. He fell over on top of him, and then he wiggled his way out and then, I think, twisted the dude's ankle. Anyway... He can't perform his uh, cartoon routine on these gentlemen. So he wasn't able to advance. Yamamoto advances, secures this leg lock, and gets this check for a million yen, which to the untrained eye looks like, wow, that man got all that money. Look at him with his shiny belt. Look at this high prestige promotion. That's 10,000 USD, y'all. That's not that much money. Like, at all. This is what the dude who fought twice in one night and won gets? I think you made this point. You're like, what does the dude who lost get paid? Yeah. What does the dude who lost in the first round get paid? Do they just give him, like, a Hershey's bar? Like, what is the payment there? They give him a a plane ticket home? Is that his payment? Maybe a... I'd have to hope two grand. I don't know if there's anywhere we could find... uh, 1,500. Payment figures for this. It's definitely under five grand. Learn Japanese and ask them. (laughs) Yeah. But if anybody uh, knows where we could find some pay figures for UFC 23, or if you just know yourself, I trust you, random YouTube commenter, tell us yourself. Tell us what, what you know about the compensation for this event. It's so weird. I, I know I already mentioned it, but like, it's just such an odd visual to see a dude with a belt that will never be defended. <laughs> like, I'm sure... He worked real hard, and, like, I'm happy for the dude, and I'm sure he's going to enjoy the the hell out of that ten grand. but it's, it's a very grandiose celebration for a dude who just made his debut tonight and will never defend the belt you just gave him. Not through any fault of his own, I should add, but through your own, like, institutional failings as a company. Away, same thing again. Oh, injury. Oh, we got an injury. Looks like it's his knee. It's the knee that was tripped, towel thrown in, the fight's over. Fight's over. Up next, we have a middleweight fight, Joe Slick and Jason DeLucia, and good lord, that man screams. That poor fucking dude. Whole, if you had just isolated that audio and asked me, is this audio of a man from an MMA fight, or is this stock horror film audio, I would have said B. No question. It yeah. was terrifying. I hope he's all right. I didn't see anything in the article about how he could never walk again, so. Uh, Joe Joe Slick is quoted as, in the post-fight interview, looks like he's hurt pretty bad. Hope he's all right. (laughs) I just (laughs) broke your fucking leg, bro. Sorry. Didn't mean to dump all your weight on your fucking knee bending the wrong way. Mm Mm-hmm. God. It was gnarly, man. I mean, the fight was kind of just getting started. There was a scramble early, and then before you could even like really acclimate yourself, we had this freak ending. Also, for Joe Slick, what a way to make your D- UFC debut! Like ruining a man's legs. Yeah, I'm sure. Like it's weird because 
It's not like the Anderson Silva situation where Chris Weidman checked a kick and Anderson's leg just snapped. Mm -hmm. Like, he did literally nothing there and won the fight. Like, it's weird to celebrate there. But here, he did kind of dump the dude and, like, do this to him. But I don't think his intent on that was, let me get dude's leg pinned behind him so I can snap it like a twig. (laughs) That's That's a hard thing to plan for. Yeah, like, you don't really intend to do that. So... He did it, but not, like, on purpose, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So, I guess you could take some credit for it. Like, that's a good debut for you. Like, the the tenor of the interview, this is the reason I'm saying all this, the tenor of the interview with Diet Joe Rogan was very awkward to me, and I felt like that was because of the weird finish. Yeah. Uh, we kind of saved you some of, well, you saw the video, so it's not like we're saving you a whole lot of gory details, but... Just looking at the picture we have on screen, you can see his foot get that. What is that? That is that's his right foot. It gets planted. Yeah, and, backwards. Uh, oh my God, getting stuck on the canvas. It doesn't move from there as he goes down, and so it like folds in this weird way behind him. Yeah, this is this is like as the momentum begins. This yeah. is like, you know, moments before disaster. Right here is what this is. So, uh, and then he screams a lot. You know, hopefully it was a speedy recovery for Jason. We wish him the best of luck. Hopefully we see him in the future. Good, good debut? Question mark for Joe Slick. Um, hopefully his next outing's a little less. They got weird. the stretcher out for him. That's right. They they did bring the stretcher out for this gentleman. Um, given that his knee was turned into like pulled pork, mm-hmm. I think this makes sense. I like the little stretcher crew they bring out every now and then. We'll get more into it in a minute, but this is not the first appearance of the stretcher gang tonight. <laughs> the happy stretchers. LASIK in this particular oh, case. Oh, a left hand did it again. And out of nowhere, right at the bell. This was my favorite fight of the night. I enjoyed the striking exchange we had early. I thought the finish was a little weird but generally pretty entertaining. I mean, we didn't get a lot of this tonight where both dudes were just trading hands. And, I, you know, I'm not the kind of MMA fan where I'm just like, give me blood knockouts. Mm-hmm. I can appreciate grappling and some more technical stuff too. But you do need a little taste, you know, in the card here and there. And this was a good taste for 1999. It stood out amongst the uh, guards and wary fighters yeah all all the guard play tonight and the uh just relative hesitancy Mm -hmm. that was not present in this fight here both eugene jackson and yamamiya came out to fight i don't know if i mentioned it already but this is a middleweight fight so both guys under 200 pounds uh came out ready to put on a show they were wailing on each other oh yeah and eugene would be the last one to wail as he would catch... This is like... If you saw the fight, this you'll is, know what I mean. This, this is a pruder very... film of a punch. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Like, he barely made contact with him, or it was like from such a strange angle he caught him. You can kind of see it here. But dude crumpled. Yamamiya said, see ya. And fucking oh Jackson God. sent him to sleep, man. We had to rewatch this punch, like, five or ten times yeah it was very confusing it was like a phantom punch because eugene is backing up as he's doing this punch and it just kind of looks like his arm waves up for a second but it's a full punch at a different angle yeah i mean it must have been a pretty powerful punch given that it prompted the first appearance of the stretcher gang of the evening so we saw them here and then we immediately saw them afterward in the joe slick Jason Delucia fight. Understandably, um, dude's leg got destroyed. This one, I was a little more surprised to see them show up. Mm. Also, I might be mistaken. I remember seeing them come out for one more fight, but then get waved off. I think it might have been the Pedro Hizo Suyoshi Kosaka fight because there was a finish there, yeah. but it wasn't a very like emphatic finish. Yeah. So they were just like on standby, like, "Do you need us? Do you need us?" And by that, point- we have a man to carry. By that point, I was sufficiently inebriated. I was just happy to see the stretcher crew coming out every time. (laughs) Part of why this was such a brawl, uh, I think, was revealed in uh, Eugene's interview with 
Mr. Worm, or as you call him, Diet, <laughs> Diet Joe Rogan, Diet Rogan after the fight, yeah. Uh, and he was asking Eugene why he didn't go to the ground and try and do the same thing that every other fighter has done tonight. Yeah, basically. why he had a different strategy. Uh, he said, no way I'm fighting the Japanese on the ground. He did say that. Um, and the Japanese do have a pretty good ground game for the most part. I mean, it's coherent. Brazilian jiu-jitsu has its origins in jiu-jitsu, which is from Japan. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese are certainly more versed in grappling than, say, like the average American fighter who's not a wrestler. So, you know, sound logic from Eugene. It seems like it served him well. It also seems like he just had the striking advantage regardless of the ethnicity of his opponent. So good, good, uh, good game plan. Those two together make sense for why he's staying on the feet. All in all, I enjoyed the card tonight. I didn't think the Kevin Randleman, uh, Pete Williams fight was super great, but you know, it crowned a new champion for us, so that gives us something to look forward to in the future. We had this fun fight here with Eugene Jackson. I, uh, if I had to give it like a one through ten rating, it gets like it gets a five. There's nothing special, but I've also seen much worse. It's very like. Eh. I'll give it a six, just for the stretcher crew. The stretcher crew does and add. Uh, the brawl and the weird finish. I haven't finished the end of the fight with uh, the Italian boys. Jason you enjoyed and Joe. seeing dude's knee get snapped. Yeah, you know it's fun to see unique stuff. It's novel. It's yeah. novel watching a knee get snapped. You don't get that every time. So it's like a. <laughs> Honestly, this is a good comparison. It's like a car wreck in NASCAR. You don't really want to tell people you're rooting for it, and you don't want anyone to die, but you're rooting for it let's there's, not fucking kid ourselves there's here, sick and nasty gentlemen. spinning cars going 300 miles per hour by you i mean like if we're going to be real transparent it's no different than getting excited when a dude's nervous system gets shut off because he got kicked in the face like yeah. it's no less dangerous than that so it's uh it is an interesting finish i'll, I'll leave it there up next we're going to be talking about pride eight and then we will be leaving the 20th century and journeying into the new millennium. Um, but before that, be on the lookout because we're going to have a special episode coming out after our episode on Friday. So, if you enjoyed the show, you enjoyed the fights, so leave a comment, tell us what you thought, hit like on the video, do all the requisite YouTube things, and we will see you guys for Pride 8 next time. Bye, we love you.